Hi guys, today we're going to be talking about azathioprine and mercaptopurine, two fairly high risk drugs um, used in a range of conditions that we're going to look into just now. So, first of all guys, um, these drugs are used in mainly conditions where you need the immune system to be suppressed. Now that is in gastrointestinal conditions such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis where we, where we want to keep the patient in remission and prevent further flare-ups and deteriorations in their health. Uh, we also use it in rheumatology, particularly in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, that does not respond to standard treatment, so if they keep on getting flare-ups you want to see them on something that will control them long term and often you'll put them on azathioprine. And another uh, area is organ transplantation because you don't want the organ to be rejected uh, uh, following a transplant, that is. So, just briefly, before we go into what azathioprine actually does, it's worth looking back at this, which is probably something we learned early on in school, medical school or pharmacy school, um, and probably in uh, actual high school too. So if we look towards the right-hand side, we can see the the DNA at the very top. Now if we pan over to the left hand picture this is uh, a diagram of the DNA essentially. We've got the the D and the P's on either side here and these are the um, the, the helix essentially. This makes up the backbone of the DNA so the blue parts that we see here. In between we see the nucleotide bases. Now these are the things that are made up of adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine and this makes up the code in the middle. Now, adenine and guanine are purines, cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines, uh, and that's important because in terms of azathioprine and mercaptopurines' mechanism of action, they act upon the purines only, so the A's and the G's, and they prevent their synthesis. So as you can imagine, if we don't have the purines being produced, so A and G has gone from here, A and G has gone from here, we have a complete break in this DNA helix. And that means transcription can't occur, translation can't occur, we don't get a nice selection of amino acids, and then subsequently we don't get formation of proteins and other um, uh, subsequent cells and uh, functions in the body. One, uh, one such function is the, the lymphocyte, one of the blood cells of the body, quite important um, and in autoimmune conditions can often lead to flare-ups and lead to damage, for example in rheumatoid arthritis to the joints, in Crohn's or ulcerative colitis to the bowel, um, or in Crohn's to anywhere uh, from top to bottom of the GI tract, uh, and in transplantation um, in terms of uh, mounting an immune response against the, uh, the organ, the foreign organ. So ultimately, uh, just before I touch on the, the mechanism of action, finally, it, it's important to mention that 6-mecaptopurine or mecaptopurine is a metabolite of azathioprine and azathioprine is broken down into mecaptopurine and mecaptopurine is further broken down into the main active substances. Um, azathioprine is a lot more common, certainly in the United Kingdom. Um, so next, as soon as you take a tablet of azathioprine or capsule or 6 mecaptopurine once it gets to its main active substances, it inhibits the synthesis of the purines, we've, which we've just touched on, adenine and guanine, thereby inhibiting DNA and RNA replication, and that is necessary for lymphocyte production. Um, and without these purines and subsequent DNA and RNA needed for lymphocyte production, we get a reduction in the number of lymphocytes overall in the body, and hence a lower immune system, and we get immunosuppression, which benefits all the conditions that we've mentioned. Now, in terms of the metabolism and excretion of azathioprine, there are two enzymes in particular. There's thiopurine methyltransferase, or TPMT for short, and there's xanthine oxidase. Now, TPMT is something that has to be tested before starting azathioprine or 6-mecaptopurine because this is uh, a very important enzyme. It's one of the, uh, the main metabolic pathways in the body. In patients who have a low level, they're going to have a low level of the enzyme, they're going to have slightly higher levels of azathioprine in the body. People who don't have the enzyme at all, uh, in that case, there's a, a greater risk of toxicity just because there's an enzyme missing that would normally break azathioprine down. So you're going to have more azathioprine in the body for a longer period of time, and that's where you can get the, uh, the myelosuppression, or the bone marrow suppression, if you will. So it's definitely worth measuring TPMT. 
If it's normal, fantastic. If it's low, you'd like you could start it, but only under specialist supervision, and it would you could probably start it at a lower dose. If it's missing missing completely, you probably would not want to start it. Um, or at least it would be down to the to the specialist to decide. The other enzyme is xanthine oxidase, and if you've studied gout or looked into allopurinol, one of the main gout preventative medications, you'd know that in gout, uric acid is produced because purines are broken down into uric acid via this enzyme, xanthine oxidase, and allopurinol works by blocking this enzyme. And that's dangerous again because if you use azathioprine and allopurinol, but allopurinol is blocking xanthine oxidase, one of the, uh, again, metabolic pathways of uh, azathioprine. That means, again, we're going to have more azathioprine in the body for a longer period of time, and hence there's a risk of toxicity. Uh, we're going to cover that later, I believe. However, I'll just mention it now that if it comes to a, a, a situation or a scenario where you need both allopurinol and azathioprine, then you'll have to reduce the azathioprine dose to a quarter of the original dose. So when you look at the BNF, the British National Formulary, azathioprine is generally dosed by a weight. By weight, So let's say a patient, uh, ultimately the dosing is to be 100 milligrams once a day. Okay, In that case, we would quarter the dose, which would mean, or rather, give one quarter of the entire dose, which would be 25 milligrams once a day instead. Next, in terms of side effects, um, the big one that we've mentioned is bone marrow suppression. That is, uh, low white blood cells, low platelets, and actually low red blood cells too. Um, it requires careful monitoring of the full blood count and dose adjustments if need be. Um, looking for neutropenia, which is very low neutrophils, is important, and thrombocytopenia, which are low platelets, is also key. In terms of other side effects, nausea is fairly common as it is with many medications. Um, it can often get better after a few weeks. If not, you can alter the dose. You can split the dose in half and take it twice a day. You can take it with food, consider antiemetics, or even temporarily reducing the dose. Uh, one such side effect that requires withdrawal of the medication completely is hypersensitivity. And if you do get that, it's fairly typical um, allergic reaction you get tiredness, dizziness, or malaise rather, dizziness, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, rashes, low blood pressure, you, uh, and subsequently you may have joint pains, you may have uh, shaking or rigors rather, and renal dysfunction. Otherwise, there are other side effects, there's a, a whole list of them I'm sure you can read, including pancreatitis and more. Patient will get a leaflet with the medication hopefully, so ultimately it's more about telling them about the main and the most dangerous side effects and when to seek professional help if need be. Uh, and obviously, as I've just mentioned, the, the more common side effects and how to manage them. If there's liver or kidney issues, we can also reduce the dose um, with specialist supervision. Important advice we've just touched on, if they get any signs of myelo or uh, suppression or bone marrow suppression, that is unexplained bleeding or bruising, which would show low platelets, malaise, fatigue, or significant paleness, which would show red blood cells, or any signs of infection, such as a sore throat, <clears> the <throat> fever, uh, again, definitely seek medical attention. In transplant patients, it's important, even if they become pregnant, that they, that they don't stop the medication. Though it can be teratogenic, and there have been low birth weights, premature births, and even spontaneous ab abortions with it, it's not worth stopping and putting the mother at risk uh, of transplant rejection. So that should be something considered prior to becoming pregnant. But if it does happen, then it's definitely something worth chatting to the to the specialist about. And we've talked about some of the side effects which may require drug withdrawal, which are uh, the hypersensitivity ones mainly. Now, in terms of monitoring, uh, you should monitor for toxicity throughout treatment, and that starts with the advice that you'd give to the patient. Um, and ultimately, the, in terms of actual blood tests, you want to look at the full blood count weekly for the first four weeks and then reduce it to once every three months. Um, and that, that should be a minimum, really. Uh, realistically, in practice, you, you never really see full blood count on its own. You'll often see it with liver function tests and urea and electrolytes. And that way you can look at the, the liver function and also the kidney function. Um, just in case there's risk of hepatotoxicity or uh, renal toxicity. 
but full blood count is the main thing. And we've touched on the symptoms, fatigue, pale skin. Uh, you could even get a, a faster heart rate, uh, easy tiring on exertion, dizziness, shortness of breath, easy bleeding, bruising, infections, and so on and so forth. And I suppose on that note, it's important to mention the LFTs. The liver function tests are also done because there's a risk of cirrhosis, in theory, with azathioprine. So it's always worth checking. And you'd avoid it if the liver function was very severely impaired. And likewise with kidney function, if it's very, very severely impaired, you'd also avoid azathioprine. If it's mildly impaired, you could just consider reducing the dose. <coughs> in terms of interactions... Uh, we've touched on allopurinol and its um, inhibition of xanthine oxidase, which is one of the the pathways of azathioprine <coughs> um, uh, metabolism. And if xanthine oxidase is inhibited, azathioprine is in the body for a longer period of time at higher concentrations and there's a risk of toxicity. And there have been deaths recorded with this interaction, actually. Reduce azathioprine to a quarter of its original dose. If you're using them together, that is. Uh, in terms of myelosuppression, any other medications which can cause uh, bone marrow suppression should be noted uh, that this can be a risk. So things such as amino oh, not so much amino salicylate, but more things like methotrexate, for example. Uh, so quite risky. Um, the British National Formulary also mentions ACE inhibitors, lisinopril, ramipril, uh, captopril, for example. Uh, may increase the risk of anemia and leukopenia, so lower white blood cells, when given with azathioprine. So monitor carefully. Um, so just be aware of it. Uh, it's not one that I knew before researching this topic further, but it's worth just having that in your head. So it increases the risk of low red blood cells and low leukocytes. So, in summary, that was a whistle-stop tour of azathioprine and its metabolite 6 mecaptopurine. We've covered what it's used for. We've covered the detailed mechanism of action, including to the, the DNA level. We've covered the role of the enzymes TPNT and xanthine oxidase in the metabolism mainly of azathioprine and 6 mecaptopurine, though they have excretory functions too. We've covered the side effects, including the main ones to mention to the patient, the common ones, as well as, oh, well, at the end of the day, they're going to get a leaflet and advise them to read through it and to just call back or come in and ask if there's any questions. We talked about, in general, important advice, uh, important advice in particular with, again, myelosuppression, as well as transplantation and pregnancy. We've talked about monitoring and how full blood count is the main uh, port of call, as well as general symptom monitoring. However, LFTs and UZDs are also done uh, routinely once every three months alongside the uh, the full blood count when the patient is stable. And lastly, we, co uh, lastly, we covered the interactions of uh, azathioprine and mecaptopurine uh, in conjunction with allopurinol and xanthine oxidase inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, which is a fairly new one, and other myelosuppressive and immunosuppressive agents. I hope that was beneficial. I hope that helped. Um, and I hope it was uh, useful for you in terms of uh, either revision or just learning more about this medication because it is a fairly high risk one. If you have any questions, feel free to put uh, to put them in the comments section. Feel free to share it with your fellow university colleagues and friends. That would really benefit me and benefit others. But otherwise, thank you very much and have a great day.